right, good morning, everyone. Um, so like Vasan said, I'll be talking about OCT, or optical coherence tomography, uh, which is five years ago relatively new. Now it's more developed and established. Um, but in the grand scheme of imaging modalities, it's still relatively new. Um, and OCT's use uh, as, in scattering as an inherent contrast in tissue samples. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I'll go into some background about various imaging modalities. Then I'll go briefly into the fundamentals of OCT, uh, what you need to understand before you really grasp the, the mechanisms behind OCT, including uh, the concept of coherence, interferometry, and scattering. Next, I'll go more into detail about the OCT principles, including equations. Um, I'm an engineer by training, so for me, uh, conceptually understanding something is one thing, but then actually seeing the math behind it actually makes a lot more sense um, about why you see the certain uh, signals that you do see. So I'll, I'll derive some of the equations and hopefully it won't be too bad. Uh, and then we'll talk about axial and lateral resolutions in terms of OCT. Finally, we'll talk about applications that OCT is commonly used in these days, uh, as well as a demo that I will set up probably right after my talk in which you'll get, be able to see um, some real-time imaging. So to begin, why do we really want to perform optical imaging when there's already uh, a lot of established imaging modalities that have attractive features such as ultrasound, MRI, and CT? In fact, MRI and CT have both won the Nobel Prize. Ultrasound uh, may or may not, depending on who you ask. Um, but these are all established techniques that have wide-ranging uses in various fields of uh, medical imaging. Well, the answer lies in the fact that optical imaging can provide high spatial resolution with high contrast and, in some cases, molecular signatures uh, for specific targeting of, of samples. In addition, optical imaging allows for non-invasive uh, probing of tissue samples using non-ionizing radiation, essentially just light. Um, so it's safe to use in a variety of in vivo situations. Uh, commonly known or commonly used optical imaging modalities include bioluminescence, confocal microscopy, uh, phase contrast techniques, uh, uh, standard fluorescence or even two-photon, multi-photon fluorescence, uh, and polarization techniques. All of these have the, in common the fact that they're either limited to surface techniques, surface imaging, or they uh, scan a, a sample basically point by point. And thus, in that case, uh, in order to provide a depth scan, they would be essentially extremely slow to use. Um, one of the attractive opportunities for that optical imaging allows is the capability to perform cross-sectional imaging, otherwise known as tomographic imaging. Um, on the top, you can commonly see a, an H&E stained uh, biopsy in which a tissue sample is taken and then thinly sliced, or frozen, sectioned, uh, and then thinly sliced, uh, thinly sliced and then stained, and then uh, investigated under a standard light microscopy. Well, what if you could do all of this without having to do all those steps? Uh, so ideally, you would, be, uh, you would have an imaging modality that could provide this cross-sectional imaging with a high resolution um, that will allow you to not have to perform these biopsies, especially in cases such as uh, the vocal cords or other sensitive tissue areas where you don't actually want to remove tissue from the, from the patient. So as you can guess from that slide, then what is OCT? OCT is an interferometric uh, imaging modality capable of providing cross-sectional tomographic slices of tissue in vivo. Uh, it provides micrometer imaging resolution, typically on the range of um, about 5 to 10 micrometers, and can provide millimeter penetration depth, uh, usually in 1 to 2 millimeters for scattering tissue. For less scattering tissue, such as the eye, it can reach up to a centimeter to 2 centimeters. Uh, lastly, OCT uses non-ionizing illumination, uh, which makes it uh, safe to use uh, in vivo and in situ. Um, and typically, the wavelengths we use for OCT are in the middle of this um, so-called optical or therapeutic window between 650 nanometers and 1350 nanometers, where scattering is predominant over absorption. So here you can just see a cross-sectional slice of a human finger. Um, this would be the epidermis, this would be the dermis, and at the very bottom you can see is part of the subcutaneous tissue layer. So that gives you a sense of idea of what you can do with OCT. So where does OCT fit in the grand scheme of things? Well, from that explanation, you can kind of understand ultrasound um, in its highest frequencies 
typically about 100 to 200 uh, megahertz transducers, can reach ax uh, uh, axial resolutions of about 15 microns. However, once you use, once you get those resolutions, you have a severe trade-off in penetration depth of about two to three millimeters. Focal microscopy um, can provide sub-micrometer, about nanometer resolution. Um, however, in scattering tissue, you're lucky to even get up to one millimeter penetration. So OCT clearly fits within this scheme of things um, where there's a lot of tissue structures, uh, ma ma macroscopic tissue structures that you would want to study in vivo uh, and you wouldn't be able to with confocal or you wouldn't be able to have the resolution with ultrasound. That being said, it's possibly easiest to understand OCT by looking at ultrasound because in the grand scheme of things, the underlying principles are, are very uh, analogous. In ultrasound imaging, uh, essentially you have a transducer that generates a pulse, a pulse wave or acoustic wave that travels out into your tissue sample. And depending on where your acoustic impedance changes are, um, echoes or echo acoustic waves will be sent back and detected by the transducer. So ultimately what happens is uh, the transducer detects the intensity of these uh, uh, these received echoes, and then the time delay of between these echoes. And by scanning across space, you can create a uh, 2D image of the acoustic uh, reflection, which is basically the standard ultrasound image that we commonly know. Well, in OCT, this is exactly the same thing, except we rely on light scattering. However, the one big difference is that the speed of sound in tissue is about 1,500 meters per second, whereas the speed of light in tissue is about 300 uh, million meters per second. Thus, you can think of it as this way. The time to take, uh, to differentiate between scatterers that are about 10 micrometers apart, which is roughly the, the standard OCT resolution, and ultrasound would be 13 nanoseconds. 13 nanoseconds. For OCT, that's 67 femtoseconds. Currently, uh, there are no detectors capable of resolving such high uh, time resolutions. Um, so directly measuring these, these light echoes currently is uh, impossible. So in that case, how do we actually measure these, echo, these light echoes? Well, the simple answer then is interferometry. Um, interferometry was, has been commonly used in various uh, fields, um, but to begin to understand interferom interferometry, it's best to gain an understanding of the concept of coherence. <coughs> coherence isn't actually the easiest thing to explain to someone. Uh, I think most of us understand what coherence is, but if you ask someone what is coherence, it would be hard pressed to give you a rigorous definition of what coherence is. But essentially coherence is uh, a measure of the correlation of two waves, either in time or space. So in order to perform uh, perfectly constructive or perfectly deconstructive interference, two waves must, be, must have a constant phase difference and the same frequency. Note that the two waves don't have to have the same wavelength, they have to have the same frequency. Slightly different, um, but it's a, it's a key understanding uh, for, for this field. Um, so here we can co see constructive interference and deconstructive interference, which is probably something we all learned either in high school physics or, or college physics. Basically, if you have two waves with the same frequency uh, and they have zero phase difference between them, they will have constructive interference in which the, the sum of the two waves is larger than each of the uh, two individual waves. Likewise, for deconstructive interference, the sum of the two waves is less than, uh, less than the, two, uh, the amplitude of the two waves uh, when they're 180 degrees out of phase. So as I mentioned earlier, you can have two types of coherence. There's spatial coherence and there's temporal coherence. Uh, spatial coherence is a measure of the correlation of waves between two points in space. Temporal coherence is a measure of uh, correlation between a wave usually and, and a copy of itself uh, with different delay periods in time. So on the bottom left here, you can see a wavefront moving across space um, that has infinite spatial coherence and infinite temporal coherence. You can see it's infinite spatial coherence because the wavefront doesn't get, uh, um, doesn't change as it propagates through space. Uh, and it has infinite temporal coherence because the phase relationship between each of these waves is constant. On the right here, you can see um, a wavefront that has poor spatial, spatial temporal coherence and poor, poor, poor spatial coherence and poor temporal coherence. Um, however, once it reaches this slit, uh, it only allows a little bit of light to, to travel through. And you, after the slit, you get high spatial coherence, but poor, still poor temporal coherence. 
So OCT relies on the fact of, of using low coherence interferometry or using um, essentially broadband light to perform this actual uh, perform uh, this detection of light echoes. So low coherence interferometry. Um, in the simplest case, if you have an interferometer, which is essentially just uh, light, a beam splitter, half of the light goes to one mirror, half the light goes to another mirror, they recombine and they're detected by a detector. Uh, in the simplest case, you have a monochromatic wave, which is just a wave with a single wavelength. Uh, so if you measure the interference pattern as a function um, of the path length difference between these two arms, so if mirror one is moving back and forth, and then delta z is the, the path length difference between the sample arm and the reference arm, and you plot out the interference pattern, you can see you can alternate between uh, constructive and deconstructive interference. Uh, and this is because as you move this mirror um, basically half a wavelength away, the resulting, the resulting, this resulting wave is 180 degrees out of phase with this wave, and you get deconstructive interference. Thus, the uh, intensity distribution, or the intensity measured by the detector is proportional to a cosine whose frequency is dependent on the wavelength, or wave number in this case, uh, and the difference between the two path lengths. Next, if we introduce, uh, instead of using, using a single monochromatic light source, if we use a laser with two wavelengths, uh, still near each other, you can see that the interference fringe for the two wavelengths, still both of them uh, uh, have constructive interference near zero path length because cosine of zero is still equal to one. However, as you go towards increasing path lengths, because they have a different uh, wavelength or wave number, the frequencies are different. Thus, when you look at this, um, the summed interference at uh, the detector, you can see that now you have this interference fringe but there is a, uh, a modulated envelope on top of it uh, that uh, reduces visibility of the interference fringe for larger path length differences. Next, we go to the case where we introduce another wavelength, and as you can see, again, the modulation envelope uh, sh shortens in width. And again, you add another one until the final case in which you use a broadband light source and you get a very, very narrow envelope uh, in which you can have interference. Um, and this envelope is defined by a, a width defined by the coherence length, LC, which is uh, something I'll derive later. But suffice to say, it's incredibly important for OCT imaging. Um, so what this is essentially saying is that there's a path length difference that the two arms must be within in order for an interference fringe um, to be visible. And this is what we call coherence gating. So if the two arms have a path length difference larger than this coherence length, the visibility of the interference fringe uh, essentially drops to zero. So then the operating principle, or um, a high level for OCT, is then that we take our low coherence light source, we split it into a beam splitter, uh, and we project it onto a reference mirror, and we have a scattering surface. In this case, we have three idealized, essentially ideal scatterers in the sample arm. So the reference arm, as we move back and forth, whoops, whoops, allows us essentially to probe deeper depths within the, the, the sample tissue. Um, so, uh, so this allows us to essentially perform range finding of the uh, uh, axial um, optical scattering uh, reflectivity profile. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, I'll, it, we'll derive it more rigorously later. Mm -hmm. So Joe, you just, just right before you went to OCT, you talked about the concepts of spatial and temporal coherence. Mm -hmm. And you also showed situations where you had uh, poor temporal coherence, but good spatial coherence. So mm -hmm. in this idealized case, are you relying both on spatial and temporal coherence, or are you relying only on one? Uh, in this idealized case, uh, we're having a collimated beam on the reference arm and a collimated beam in the sample arm. Uh, so it's, we require high spatial coherence. Um, as light travels through tissue samples, it becomes less spatially coherent. Here you're, here but in, you're in this case, in this case, idealized case, we want this is high spatial coherence, but uh, low temporal coherence. Right, so you could get away with something that has yes. low, poor temporal coherence. And yes. Still 
uh, very high performance as long as there's no scattering. Yes, the, the, the poor temporal coherence in this case is actually desired because it allows us to have this have this this uh, small coherence length, uh, which as we move forward, you'll see the importance of that. So, so to reiterate, so actually that poor temporal coherence comes about due to the broad due to the broad bandwidth of the laser. Yeah. So as we add more and more wavelengths to this, we reduce the the, the width of the, the 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 modulation window, or we re essentially reduce the coherence length of the laser. Okay. Uh, so I don't actually know how much of scattering you covered. Um, did you cover this? Yes, but you can do more. Okay. Then I'll, then I'll just go through this fast. Uh, so the scattering regime is broken up into two predominant uh, regimes. There are, there are other cases of scattering, but for the most case, for the most situations, we refer to as either relay or me scattering. And Rayleigh is just a ideal, or is a, is a special case of me scattering. Um, Rayleigh scattering occurs when particles are typically less than the wavelength that you're using, the wavelength of light that you're using, whereas me scattering typically occurs when the particles are greater than or equal to your wavelength. Uh, race, Rayleigh scattering is usually highly isotropic, whereas me scattering, um, as the particles get larger and larger, becomes more and more anisotropic, meaning uh, typically scattering occurs in the forward direction. Um, Rayleigh scattering is also the reason why the sky is blue, um, and it's also the reason why the sky is red at sunset, because uh, as at sunset, the light rays from the sun have to travel through more air. Uh, as they travel through more air, the blue light becomes scattered more and more until essentially there's only left, you're only left with red light. Um, but in the terms of OCT for uh, visualizing uh, biological tissues, such as cells, um, Typically, we're predominantly in the me scattering regime. So, as I mentioned earlier, OCT is heavily reliant on scattering, and such uh, scattering is the inherent contrast agent in OCT. So, therein lies the challenge of how do we separate the desired scatterers from the undesired scatterers in OCT? By undesired scatterers, what I mean is, um, in this case, in a highly scattering tissue, as you interrogate uh, as they interrogate the tissue, you have these, in this case, the yellow um, scatterer, which is a ballistic backscatter photon. These are the photons you want. They undergo single scattering. They hit, um, they hit a particle, and they go back straight to the detector. Um, you also have these particle, uh, you have, also have these scatterers, which are known as small angle scatterers, which uh, typically scatter once or twice, and then go back, uh, go back to uh, your detector. But you also, in the worst case, have these multiple scattered effects, uh, which uh, light basically scatters multiple times, five, six times, or more. Uh, and these are the undesirable scatterers. Um, for OCT, or at least for, for biological tissue, the, the, the scattering coefficient is typically on the order of about 50 to 100 uh, inverse micrometers. Um, and it's even higher for blood. So what happens is for these single scatter photons, they allow us to directly interrogate uh, this tissue layer in depth. Whereas these, these multiple scatterers, because they scatter multiple times, they have different time delays. Um, and they essentially, when we look at the OCT fringe, um, if, these two light, if these two photons were essentially launched at the same time, when they arrive back to the detector, they're actually at different time points. Um, whereas this, this photon is telling us information about this depth. Uh, this photon is actually arriving back at the detector with uh, photons that were launched later, and thus reducing the resolution that we can achieve at that point. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Uh, so how do we get rid of these undesirable multi-scattered events? Well, like I said earlier, we have coherence gating, which is essentially we can only we can only perform interference uh, between backscatter photons and our mirror at, at certain path length differences um, between uh, the sample and the reference arm. So thus you can see, by having a very, very narrow coherence width, uh, coherence length, you can essentially bandpass filter out these multiple, these longer multiple scattered events, uh, and thus achieve a much finer or lower axial resolution than you would otherwise be able to achieve. Um, the drawbacks of having scattering as a contrast agent, however, 
uh, are essentially, this is kind of hard to see, but uh, scattering as scattering in itself has limited penetration depth because as a further as as you go further and further, uh, the photons become more and more scattered until the point where they become incoherent and you can't perform interference with them anymore. So here on the left is just a simple experiment. Um, essentially, we have four four uh, plastic sheets. And this one, we have water. And this one, we have 1% intralipid, 2% intralipid, 5% intralipid, and finally 10% intralipid. Intralipid, if you don't know, is essentially milk creamer, um, where it's just fancy milk creamer, essentially. Uh, but here you can see well, the scattering depth um, in this. Uh, so this is a, a, just a, a silicone phantom. The scattering depth for the water layer goes to about here. For 1% intralipid, about here. And then as you go more and more intralipid, essentially you do not, you, you can't penetrate or your scatterer, your, your photons no longer uh, penetrate deep enough in order to interrogate the tissue that you desire. So in the case when we're looking at vascular blood flow, this can actually come into play um, and prevent us from looking at um, deeper uh, vasculature if there's an overlying larger uh, 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 vessel on top of it. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, um, in OCT, we, don't, we, we want to filter out these multiple scattering events because uh, they essentially reduce the actual resolution because they're interfering, or they're 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 interfering with um, delayed photons, which are supposed to be interrogating a different depth. Um, so this is actually performed using Monte Carlo simulations by uh, uh, Dr. Rikong Wong over at, at University of Washington. And here you can see, uh, in this case, uh, the circle line is. Um, the, the measured axial resolution as a function of probing depth uh, for a uh, anisotropic scatter with, um, uh, with, with a G factor of about 0 0.7. G, I'm not, did you cover G? Okay. Well, so G factor is basically how, uh, a measure of how forward scattering or how backward scattering um, uh, the tissue is. Um, so as you go to higher, higher scattering, in this case, the, the square and the diamond, you can see uh, that the actual resolution, or actually, no, just the square, the actual resolution falls off as you increase the number of scatterers. And in this case, <clears throat> the diamond is actually higher anisotropic um, scattering. So this is a G factor of 0 0.9, um, which means the scatterers are no longer uh, scattering off to the sides. They're mainly forward scattering. Um, and the reason why this is actually less is because forward scattering um, actually increases the number of uh, small angle scatterers that actually arrive back um, at the detector. Uh, likewise, the last drawback or major drawback with scattering contrast is the fact that there is no selectivity. Um, what you get is what you get. Uh, scattering, um, typically, if you go from 800 nanometer to 1.3 nanometer uh, wavelength, uh, the scattering isn't going to change as a function of wavelength. It's, it's very, the dependence of wavelength is very limited. Um, so you don't, unlike absorption-based techniques such as fluorescence, you don't get molecular sensitivity. Um, uh, so you can't actually um, filter out uh, specific targets in your sample. Okay, um, so now we'll begin some of the, the math derivations for OCT. Um, I'll try to go through this step-by-step. Uh, step. If anyone has parts where they don't understand, just stop me. Um, but, yeah. So, actually, if you're going back to your previous slide, so, again, I want to try and tie this whole issue back to loss of coherence, right? Mm -hmm. So, could you, could you talk about this concept of how the introduction of scattering at more superficial layers affects, um, because there's some aspects that you want low coherence, mm -hmm. and there's some aspects that you want high coherence in order to have so can you kind of talk about this in the context of coherence? What coherence is being maintained and what coherence is being degraded? Okay. Um, so in the case where I said the ideal, uh, in the example before in the idealized case, we wanted high spatial coherence. And this is still the same case. We want high spatial coherence. However, as light essentially enters this highly scattering regime, it, uh, so intralipid, intralipid is actually more isotropic than blood. So in this case, the, the light is basically going everywhere. 
in every direction. So as, as the light enters into the scattering regime, it's being scattered in all the kinds of directions. So you're essentially losing spatial coherence. Um, and because it's so isotropic, uh, as you get further, deeper, and deeper, um, more and more scattering events occur, and the, the photons actually become diffuse. Um, and by diffuse, I mean they become incoherent. Uh, so in, 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 in the, the low scattering regime, most of the scattering events are elastic. Uh, but as you increase the number of scattering events, it becomes more and more inelastic or it becomes more diffuse. Um, and that, in that case, you cannot actually perform uh, uh, interference with your, 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 your reference arm light. Uh, so here, yeah. I might add is that you know, one thing that's interesting is that when you have the low G values, not only is your axial resolution degrading, but you can't probe deeply because yeah. at a large depth, you've, yeah. you don't have any photons left that have maintained the, spatial coherence with the So source. essentially, the, uh, the number of backscattered photons is already really, really, really low in this case. Uh, the only reason we can see it is because interferometry has very high sensitivity. Uh, but as you go further and further deeper into high scattering medium, essentially the number of backscatter photons that can make it through all of this and make it all the way back to your detector uh, pretty much becomes undetectable. Um, and that explains essentially why, or partially explains why your axial resolution just drops and the visibility drops as you go further and deeper into tissue. Okay, so in this case, uh, it's best to, to begin by just looking at the um, illumination, the electric field of the illumination source. So in this case, EI is the electric field of the laser. Uh, SKW is the complex amplitude as a function of uh, wave number and angular frequency. Uh, and then cosine KZ minus omega T is just your wave, wave equation, uh, which um, is, is what you get when you solve Maxwell's equations. Um, for a wave in space, 2D space. Uh, so this, um, the electric field, or the, the light, essentially gets split into the reference arm, the sample arm, as I said before. Uh, and so the electric field, um, the returning electric field from the sample arm can be described as this. It's this factor of square root of two is because we're looking at the electric field and not power. The beam splitter essentially halves power, so electric field uh, uh, power is proportional to the electric field squared. Um, so the electric field has a square root of two. And this RS is essentially the, reflect the electric field reflectivity of this mirror. Uh, and this ranges between zero and one. So the returning electric field from the sample arm is, is here, and the returning electric field from the reference arm is here. Uh, the detector intensity is, as I mentioned, proportional to the electric field squared, but it's also, uh, we also perform a, uh, a time integral over the, the detector response time. Um, so essentially, the detector response is proportional to uh, rho over 2, which is the detector responsivity, or the gain of the detector, times the, uh, um, the time integral of the uh, electric field squared, and the electric fields sum together. So by expanding this, uh, when we're doing um, the electric, since we're talking about the complex electric field, we actually it's actually, when you square it, it's, uh, the electric fields times the conjugate of the electric fields. Um, and then when we substitute the electric field back into this equation, we, we, we uh, arrive here. So this is just simple substitution. Um, and we can actually simplify this by removing out this omega t term uh, because, again, we're performing the integration. Um, we're performing an integration of this uh, detector signal over the response time of the detector. Uh, and the angular frequency of light is so fast that in terms of the detector response time, essentially it's not oscillating in time. Um, yeah? Just a question on your cosine 2kz. Oh, sorry. Just a question on, on your cosine 2kz sub s yeah. uh, minus omega t. Where did that 2 come from? Oh, sorry. So the 2 comes into play because the light has to travel this distance once and twice. I see. Thank That's, you very much. Sorry about that. I should have brought that up. Thank you for that. Uh, so again, we can we simplify because we're taking the time uh, the, the the time integral over the response time, and then we expand this term, uh, and we get that the uh, detector current or detector signal as a function of wave number or the spectral signal, um, 
is equal to SK is essentially just uh, the time integral of the of the complex electric field, and it's it's basically the uh, the, the power spectral um, shape, uh, the power spectral density of the of the laser. Uh, so basically, just the power distribution as a function of wavelength for the laser. Um, so it's SK this this power uh, um, distribution times RS, which is um, basically the square of the uh, electric field um, reflectivity, which is now just power reflectivity. So RS squared plus RR squared, plus here we see we have this modulation term um, that, that fluctuates as a function of uh, path length difference between the, um, the sample arm and the reference arm and the uh, sp uh, spectral wave number. So here, as you can see, to simplify, we have this DC term, which doesn't um, have any oscillations. And then we have a cross-correlation term, which oscillates, again, as a function of uh, path length difference in the two arms. So in this case, this is the ideal case where we only have one sample reflector. However, when we're performing actual imaging, there's never just one sample reflector. There's uh, essentially infinite sample reflectors, um, and it's just a, an infinite delta train. So in this case, we can just take a simple case of three, uh, and we can just call the R RSZ, or the sample reflectivity profile. And this is actually what we're trying to um, solve for when we look at OCT. Uh, it's just a summation of, um, of individual uh, sample reflectivities times a delta function. So now when we plug in this RSZ back into that equation, we, and we, we expand terms, we essentially get, still we have this DC term, RR, XL, except now we have summation of RS, RN. And now we have cross-correlation terms, uh, again, this, this term, so the summation of all of these terms, and then we also have autocorrelation terms. And these autocorrelation terms arrive basically as just it's the interference between um, reflections, uh, between sample reflections. So it would be this interference term, this interference term, and this interference term. So again, the desired signal that we're trying to recover is the sample reflectivity. Um, so to note here, so this DC term, uh, essentially we can ignore or we can, we can filter out because it's DC. And our desired term actually has a, has a frequency to it. So we can perform essentially lock-in amplifying or lock-in detection and only recover this signal. And the autocorrelation terms, <clears throat> typically the sample reflectivities are very small compared to the reference reflectivities. So your reference reflectivity will typically be on the order of about 0.9 to 1. Sample reflectivities will be, if you're lucky, 0.1, but most of the time not even that high. Um, so this term actually... Uh, is very, very uh, faint and typically is, is low frequency because the, the distance between the two sample reflectors is also very short. Um, so you can see here in this correlation term, because we're pouring interferometry and the reflectivity of the reference arm is higher, this actually boosts the visibility of the sample, reflecti uh, sample reflectors. So the actual detectors, detected signal that we get out of the detector, however, is not the spectral signal. The detected signal is, um, as, a, uh, as we said before, as we, oh, this is going to take a while. As, as, this, uh, as we tune the reference arm, the detected signal is a function of the path length difference between the two arms, and it's actually the integral, integral of the spectral signal over your entire bandwidth, or over your entire, uh, the, the total number of wavelengths that you're using. So if we perform the integration uh, and write it out, uh, you can see here that again you have this DC term, and then here you have a, a, uh, um, a frequency a modulated term and then this is actually a Gaussian, uh, I don't know how, or how, how many of you remember statistics or whatnot from college. But this is actually a Gaussian. Um, so we have this interference fringe that fluctuates as a function of the path length difference um, between the sample reflectivity, or the sample reflector and the, and the reference reflector. And then it's modulated on top of it by this Gaussian that has um, uh, that has a, uh, uh, has a width dependent on the, the spectral bandwidth K of the laser. So just making sure everyone understands that, right? So we have a, a spectral oscillation 
right? Which is what we typically, what you're used to seeing for the fringe that fluctuates as a function, um, as a function of the path length difference. And on top of that, like I said in the earlier low coherence interferometry, we have this Gaussian that modulates uh, the, the visibility of that envelope. So, Joe, so just to reiterate, so what's of relevance with respect to lateral resolution of an OCT system is essentially the delta k squared term, right? Axial that, resolution. Axial. Axial. Resolution. You said lateral. Oh, okay. Yeah. I meant axial. Axial yeah. resolution. Depth resolution is governed by basically the width the of the width. Gaussian. The width, yeah. Right. So here, uh, you can see it in action. So for these sample reflectivities, uh, the actual detective response as we, basically the reference arm is moving um, in space and then we're probing these spaces in the sample arm, you can see that there's a fringe that fluctuates based on uh, the path length difference between the two arms. And then also this envelope, which is dependent on the, the spectral width of, of the laser. So I have another question, Joe. So it's, it looks as though you know what the frequency of this oscillation yeah. would be in the fringe itself. Exactly. So the question is, is that, I mean, in reality, in your tissue, it's, it's fully heterogene, mm -hmm. heterogeneous. Can you use the fact that you know what the frequency of that oscillation should be such that you can find kind of the mean centroid of that mm -hmm. envelope and then look for any other frequencies that are different from that frequency to see if there are other scatterers that are embedded in that, in that fringe. Yep. So what happens is, as you scan through this depth, as, you're, as basically as your reference arm is moving, it's creating, uh, it's creating a essentially Doppler frequency. Um, uh, and that, that determines essentially what this, this frequency in between these fringes are. And then so you can perform what we call lock-in detection, or you can perform demodulation. Um, essentially, you just you, you, you bandpass filter around a certain amount of frequency, and you only detect around that frequency. And so your desired fringe, uh, so this signal is actually not, so this is actually zero. This is actually some DC level. Um, so this DC level, you can actually be removed by, by only looking at, only by bandpass filtering and only looking at the frequency components that you want. Uh, and this actually allows for a very, very high, um, or a very large sensitivity increase uh, for, for OCT detection. And which is one of the reasons why OCT is actually feasible. Um, without this the sensitivity of OCT, it'd probably be about 10 to 20 dB lower. Uh, and so imaging would be actually very, very hard in biological tissue. So uh, again, from this, then we could take the envelope, basically, basically just uh, performing a Hilbert transform, if you know what that is, but essentially just looking at um, the, the modulation envelope. Uh, and then we can plot this out, and this essentially becomes our OCT image. So from here, I believe this is the next slide, you can see that by using, um, again, with the modulation envelope, by using a laser with a narrower bandwidth, this modulation uh, envelope increases in width, or the coherence length increases. But by using a broader laser, we can shrink the coherence length of this laser, uh, and essentially, in this case, what this means is we shrink this width, and thus we reduce our axial resolution. So axial resolution for OCT is completely dependent on uh, the bandwidth of the laser. Yeah. With the, uh, with the broadband source there, it looks like you're, uh, maybe I'm just reading this wrong, but it looks like outside of the main coherence length, uh -huh. you're getting little harmonics or something that yeah. get stronger again. Does that ever become a problem? Uh, harmonics, so the harmonics arise because, uh, it's mainly because of the spectral shape of, of your laser. Uh, Gaussians are nicest. Um, you never fully get rid of them. You just kind of have to deal with them. Um, in the ideal mathematical case, if you could use infinite, uh, if you could use infinite wavelengths, um, basically, if you had a laser that was still had coherence and it was infinite wavelengths, this would just become a delta, and thus your harmonics would go away. Uh, but you can't really do that in real life. Do you just have to correct for it post image and say, uh, future, our harmonics look like this, or do you just ignore them? Typically, it just it, it, it becomes it reduces your contrast essentially. Okay. 
So you can imagine it as like you would have another delta here. So you would just basically have a larger background noise. Um, but in terms of uh, axial resolution, which is just half, uh, we usually define it as full with half max of the envelope. It, it usually doesn't affect it that much. Yeah, so the equation for coherence length, uh, which, I'll, which finally derived here, is essentially dependent on the center wavelength over the bandwidth of the, of the laser. So as you can see, by using a broader bandwidth laser, you can uh, reduce the coherence length and increase your axial resolution. Similarly, you can use a laser with smaller center wavelength and also get the same effect. Um, essentially, a lot of people nowadays try to use visible light for OCT, uh, which is incredibly hard. I don't really know why you want to, uh, because the coherence lengths are, are almost one to two micrometers. Uh, and it's actually really hard to even see interference or to, 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 to tune your system. <clears throat> so in the previous lecture, we talked about how the optical properties of tissues are wavelength dependent mm -hmm. and how scattering tends to be higher at shorter wavelengths than mm -hmm. longer wavelengths. So obviously, although you have a source that has this nice Gaussian shape, if you are able to probe with depth, mm -hmm. the amount of light of, that's available, yeah. that spectrum is actually changing with depth. Yeah. Which And so then the reality also is, is that your coherence length in reality, is also changing with depth. Yeah. So do you guys have a sense of kind of what is, you know, you have the, the ideal coherence length and how much, you know, if you're probing a millimeter, for instance, do you have a sense of how much that coherence length is actually increasing with depth due to the drop-off or the, the modification of the, of the spectrum of available light with depth? There, there have been some studies on it, but... Most of the community ignores it. Uh, I mean, so, okay, in the worst case, right, if you're going from a laser with about 100 nanometers bandwidth to a laser with about 60 nanometers bandwidth, your resolution drops from about, uh, about 8 micrometers down to about 7, right? So you're talking about a micrometer drop in resolution. So the actual change, uh, basically, so, yes, the amount of the... The coherence length of light changes as you get deeper into tissue, just based on the, the number of wavelengths that propagate down there. Uh, but in the scheme of things, it's not usually visible. Uh, what happens more often becomes visible would be dispersion effects. Basically, as, as light, light of different wavelengths travels at different speeds in, in different mediums. Um, so that actually can affect and, and broaden your axial resolution. So that actually occurs more than I would say the coherence length changing. Um, but Vossen did remind me, um, longer wavelengths do penetrate deeper, shorter wavelengths do penetrate less. Uh, so there is a trade-off. Uh, typically we do, most, uh, most of our tissue imaging is done at 1.3 nanometers because there's a, there's a nice uh, uh, minimum in the water absorption at 1.3. Um, and uh, there's very little hemoglobin absorption at 1.3, so we can actually get about 1.5 millimeters into normal tissue. Uh, for eye imaging, since the water absorption is much higher at 1.3 than 800, you typically do it at 800. Um, so there are trade-offs for everything. Uh, I know some of the people in the community are trying to go all the way out to 1.7, um, trying to look further and further. But again, as you go, as this increases, this is a factor. This, this is also squared. Uh, to achieve the same axial resolution requires a much, much broader source. So it, it's very difficult. Uh, so axial resolution is completely source dependent. Lateral resolution, on the other hand, is just as with most other optical techniques, completely uh, optics dependent. So the optical resolution, typically, if you use just uh, a Gaussian estimation of, of this lens, uh, is dependent on the, the wavelength, uh, the focal length of the lens, and the, the diameter of the uh, illuminating beam. <clears throat> or, the, or you can express it in terms of the numerical aperture of the lens. Likewise, the depth of focus is dependent on the um, lateral resolution and the, uh, the, the wavelength being used. So I don't know if anyone noticed it or whoever remembers Fourier transforms. 
But one of the important things, so everything I, I explained to you before, before where we're scanning the reference arm in space is what we call time domain OCT. We call it time domain because we're actually scanning, um, we're scanning different depths as a function of time. However, if you look closely and you look at this relationship that I, that I put up earlier, the detector current uh, that we detect at Z, or essentially time because we're scanning depth as a function of time, is the integral of the spectral signal uh, across all of the spectrum. And if you know anything about Fourier transforms or if, if it looks familiar at all, you'd be right to say that there is a Fourier relationship between uh, the, the depth signal and the spectral signal. And essentially what you can do is essentially take, uh, if you can detect the, the intensity signal as a function of wave number or the spectral signal, you can immediately take a Fourier transform and recover uh, this um, the, the, the depth signal, the, the depth reflectivity of the sample. So there's two main techniques to do this. One is called spectral domain OCT, and the other is swept source OCT. Uh, in spectral domain OCT, the idea is you still have the broadband source, so it's the same uh, as the time domain case. However, at the detection end, instead of det being detected by a uh, detector immediately, you use a grading uh, and you separate the light as a function of wave number. And then you use a CCD camera which has, which has multiple pixels, and you detect uh, each wave, or you detect individual or discrete wavelengths as a function um, uh, independently of each other on, on the detector. So you, you immediately detect this IK. And the term is swept source OCT, which is actually probably the predominant technique used today. Uh, instead of using a broadband source, you use a tunable laser. So as a function of time, the wavelength is changing. So uh, for, the wavelength will start from basically 1250, and at the end of the sweep, it'll end at 1350. So in this case, you have a time-encoded laser where at each discrete point in time, there's a discrete wavelength. Well, I say discrete, but it's continuous. Um, and this, this allows you to directly detect the signal as a function of time because your signal is already, um, is already separated into spectral, uh, spectral components. So in both of these cases, you directly perform the Fourier transform and you can recover um, the, the OCT signal. And they also have the nice advantage of, for Fourier domain techniques, they have an uh, increased sensitivity advantage over traditional time domain techniques, which I won't derive here because it gets really messy. But essentially, because we're probing, um, in the spectrometer case, we're probing multiple channels at the same time, where M is the number of channels, and in swept source OCT, we're probing multiple depths at the same same time. Uh, we're probing multiple depths all at once. You get this M over two increase um, in in sensitivity. Uh, this o this factor of one half actually occurs because uh, if you know anything about Fourier transforms, when you do a Fourier transform on a on a real signal, essentially you get a uh, your desired term, and you also get a complex conjugate term on the other end. So this actually reduces half your imaging range, so we reduce the sensitivity by a factor of two. However, spectral domain and, and, and swept source OCT have, have numerous advantages beyond sensitivity. They're also incredibly fast compared to old time domain OCT systems. Uh, so this was actually from 2016, but I think this is actually out of date already. Um, within the last two years, OCT source development has skyrocketed. Um, so I came in somewhere around 2010, so uh, even 400K was fast. The lasers I came in using were about 20 kilohertz repetition rate. Uh, we're talking about now up to 600, uh, so this is actually yeah, out of date. We're actually talking about 600 megahertz repetition rate lasers, um, which uh, back in the day when I started, getting a fast enough laser was a problem. Nowadays getting a fast enough digitizer is a problem. We actually can't keep up with the lasers. Um, they actually go too fast for, for traditional uh, hardware to detect. But you can see here, this one time domain sc scale, uh, repetition rate was 50 hertz. So for an old time domain image, um, typically an image is about 500 A lines. You could take up to 10 seconds to require a single image. So um, for biological tissue, that induces a lot of motion artifact problems, uh, which uh, kind of reduce OCT's usefulness, but with the introduction of swept source OCT and spectral domain OCT, uh, we can perform imaging at rates of 100 to 200 to, to 500 Im uh, images per second. So Joe, um, 
clearly we see that the um, imaging speed is increasing, but it sounds like there's something intrinsic to laser technology such that as you want, as you desire faster repetition rates, you're the, the spectral bandwidth is, is getting narrower and narrower because your actual resolution is getting poorer and poorer. So, uh, is there, so can the, you just give us some insight into that and whether, uh, I mean, it may not be, you know, so it, it kind of, it may not matter, but I'm just curious to see is, is, is that a true trade off or, or are there advances forthcoming that may allow you to go faster without you know, having, a, say, a five fold degradation? So, as I said before, this is kind of out of date. Uh, laser to topologies are, are incredibly complex. Um, every laser topology has advantages and disadvantages. Um, in some cases, so FDML stands for Fourier Domain Mode Lock Laser. Um, typically, the, the resolution of these is poorer because we require, so okay, in an FDML laser, it's essentially you can imagine it as a, as a, a ring, a, a fiber ring, uh, and there's a filter here that is a tunable filter as a function of time. So it's constantly lasing light, but as, as, each li uh, as a function of time, the wavelength of the light being lased changes. Um, so it's completely dependent on this filter, and developing high-speed filters that are broadband is, is pretty tough. Uh, so that's why typically FDML lasers, you see them drop the axial resolution as a function of increasing um, repetition rate. However, uh, with newer lasers, so there, there's VIXEL lasers, which are vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, um, which are, uh, so a lot of what OCT takes comes from, from, from telecom. Um, actually, almost pretty much everything we take comes from telecom. Uh, if it wasn't for the telecom industry, I'm not sure OCT would exist because I don't think anyone would develop the components for us, but uh, a lot of telecom industries realized, hey, we can just market this as OCT and raise the price fivefold uh, and sell it to us, which is kind of what they do. <laughs> so VIXELs are kind of one of those. Well, there is development of VIXELs, but uh, essentially a VIXEL is a, a semiconductor laser with a very, very short cavity, um, which allows long coherence length imaging. Uh, in this case for VIXELs, um, the, the uh, the, the bandwidth that's able to be supported by the laser is actually completely semiconductor dependent. Um, <clears throat> uh, so basically what the semiconductor can lase is what bandwidth you can get out of it. And those typically are still on the orders of about 100 nanometers. So those resolutions are pretty much on par with about the 9 to 8 to 7 micrometer resolutions. Um, there are even more laser topologies, but I won't really get into it. But suffice to say, there is trade-offs. Uh, typically, the faster you go, the lower your sensitivity is, um, just because the, the detection bandwidth of your, your system has to go up. And when your detection bandwidth goes up, your sensitivity usually drops. Um, so, so there's a trade-off. Um, but for the most part, it seems to be that resolution is staying roughly, roughly similar, and, and speeds are just skyrocketing out. Uh, okay, so with that, I'll introduce some functional offshoots of OCT, or just one in this case, what we call Doppler OCT. Uh, and Doppler OCT was actually pioneered, actually, by my advisor uh, over at the Beckman Laser Institute. And it takes a lot of um, uh, uh, cues from Doppler ultrasound. Uh, so the idea here is just like when you hear a, a police siren coming towards you or away from you, uh, there's a frequency shift in, in the sound. Um, basically based on the velocity of the, of the emitting source. So the same is the case for, for light. Um, depending on uh, the speed, uh, so for moving particles, depending on the speed, uh, they will impart a Doppler shift onto the backscattered light. And so uh, the Doppler, the, the amount of Doppler shift is defined as basically um, the, the change in the amount of velocity change um, over the speed of light times the center frequency. Uh, so in turn, we can simplify this in terms of this scale. So if we have our red blood cells traveling at a speed of V, uh, and then uh, at an angle theta relative to our interrogation beam, then the Doppler frequency shift caused by uh, the red blood cell motion can be defined as just two times the velocity times the cosine theta over the center wavelength being used. Um, so for many years, 
people perform this measurement by, by essentially doing short time Fourier transforms, basically looking at uh, breaking up your, your spectral uh, signal into smaller subsets and then looking, um, looking at the Doppler shift that way. However, uh, about seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, it was determined that you can do this simply by looking at the phase of the signal. So again, uh, essentially, uh, the backscatter signal, because it will have a Doppler shift, will either move, uh, or so because of the, 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 the motion of the, of the particles, uh, they will either move up or downwards, and this up or downwards motion results in a phase shift in the backscatter signal. And you can correlate phase shift, uh, you can directly measure phase shift as long as it doesn't wrap um, by being 2 pi essentially equals into uh, one wavelength of the light source you're being used. Does that make sense? All right, so 2 pi, essentially, if we're using 1.3 nanometers, 2 pi would mean we traveled 1.3 nanometers. <clears throat> so as long as you don't travel past 1.3 nanometers and you don't wrap, you can discriminate <clears throat> how far you move just by looking at the phase difference between, um, between two points. So essentially, we can describe the Doppler shift as a function of the change in phase over uh, cha over time uh, divided by two pi, and that just tells us how much uh, frequency our, our particles have undergone. So, using this, we can now, uh, like I said earlier, we can't we have no molecular contrast, but that but just because we don't have molecular contrast doesn't mean we can't see things such as blood. So, in this case, blood flow. This is in and this is a mouse, and this is a a, a rat uh, that has their their cranium shaved. And then we use OCT and we perform Doppler imaging. So here you can clearly see um, <clears throat> the color here uh, basically represents, so this is an on-phos projection. The color represents the depth um, of the vessels uh, within the scan. So by performing Doppler imaging, we can find the particles that have um, high frequency shifts, uh, and then we can isolate those, and then we can clearly see the vasculature uh, within the background noise uh, of the brain. So Doppler allows us powerful tools to essentially measure, um, in this case, blood cells, which we wouldn't other, otherwise be able to visualize just based on molecular contrast. So a key aspect of getting velocity is, it seems to be the angle at which the scatter is moving. And, and also, if the angle is 90 degrees, then you get no Doppler shift. So if, yes. if, if the movement is completely horizontal. So in reality, how, how is theta determined? Uh, <clears throat> for most cases, you typically put your sample at a slight angle, and then you just assume that's the normal. Because, I mean, determining the vasculature of, of vessels down here is actually very difficult. You can... What you can do is you can perform, since OCT provides depth sectioning, you can perform, you can create a 3D volume, you can trace out the vasculature, and if you really wanted to be meth uh, completely methodological, you just you, you you actually can measure the angle of the vasculature relative to the orientation that you scan it. But for the vast majority of papers, it's just you place their object at an angle and you take that angle. <clears throat> But yeah, you're right. Uh, at 90 degrees, you have no Doppler signal. So if, if your motion was completely in this direction, you would see no Doppler shift. Uh, but that's actually, that's actually really hard to do. <laughs> OK, so with that, I'll introduce some of the applications that OCT is commonly used for. Um, so OCT, uh, the first papers in OCT were, were first developed in 1991. Um, uh, and they are predominantly looking at ophthalmology or uses in the eye because the eye is pretty transparent, and so there's very little uh, scattering. You know, this allows you to either visualize the anterior chamber or the retinal layers of the eye. However, um, over time, OCT has been expanded to being used in the brain, in the ear, uh, for various oral cancers, in the airway, uh, for cardiovascular disease, and including the GI tract. Um, uh, pretty much name it in the human body and OCT has probably been applied there. And this is all allowed for because uh, OCT has the nice advantages of being able to use fiber optics to deliver light. Uh, so pretty much any thin vessel within the body uh, 
you can deliver light to. You can deliver light to, and we can perform OCT imaging. But as I said before, uh, even today, I would say about 90% of most papers published are focused in ophthalmology. Uh, commercially, ophthalmology is where OCT is strongest. Uh, however, cardiovascular imaging has also increased. Um, but the yeah, simple idea here is you have a light source, uh, you perform sample scanning across the eye. In this case, you can either uh, focus your light onto uh, the anterior chamber, or you can use the lens of the eye itself to focus on the retinal layers. Uh, and you can perform cross-sectional imaging, uh, and you can visualize the sclera, the cornea, the aqueous layer, including the lens. <clears throat> so this was an old time domain image. Uh, in this case, you're able to measure, perform in, uh, in vivo measurements basically on the, the thickness of the uh, aqueous layer. Uh, and then here is a more recent uh, uh, image of the retinal layer using uh, Fourier domain OCT. You can clearly see sensi uh, the, the sensitivity advantage between Fourier domain OCT and time domain OCT, uh, although this is averaged. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, the high axial resolution of the system allows for essentially find segmentation of, of the various layers within the retinal uh, epithelium. But even beyond that, what OCT is commonly being used for these days is angiography. Uh, and in angiography, we're essentially performing correlation of the scattering contrast. Um, so essentially, vasculature, uh, because it's in motion, typically has a, a lower intensity uh, comparing to outline tissue. Um, and so we can perform correlation to, to find cross correlation across images to find these spaces, and then highlight the areas that high, have high correlation, which correspond to vasculature. In this case, we're performing sectioning um, within the retinal layer of various layers, uh, and you can see the complex vasculature. Uh, just so this is angiography. This is actually isn't Doppler. So angiography tells you where there is blood flow but it doesn't tell you any information about the speed of the blood flow or the frequency of the blood flow, whereas Doppler can actually do that. Uh, and then more recently, we've groups have been able to perform whole eye imaging, which is essentially using super long coherence, um, I shouldn't say coherence, like super long imaging range lasers um, that allow interrogation uh, across essentially the entire eye. So in this case, you can actually see this is a 3D projection of a, of a patient, you can actually see the, the surrounding tissue around the eye, the anterior chamber, and also the retinal layer, all in one OCT scan. So instead of having to perform separate scanning, changing the optics to also focus down here, you can just perform single scanning uh, at once. Uh, I mentioned earlier OCT is also used in cardiovascular imaging, um, and it's desirable because uh, Many of the most dangerous plaques that, that are developed in cardiovascular imaging are known as, are, are known as uh, thin cap fibroathromas. And these are the plaques that are, are most prone to rupture and leading to heart attacks. Uh, and they're characterized by essentially a very, very thin uh, uh, cap uh, overlaying a very dense lipid pool. Um, <clears throat> so traditionally, ultrasound techniques, because their resolution is poor, can't really visualize this thin cap very well. They can see the lipid pool, uh, but OCT allows us to actually visualize these pool. Uh, in addition, OCT allows us to, to better visualize stent placement. So on the left, you can see the, 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 place, the initial placement of a stent. Uh, you can see the shadows caused by the metal wires on the stent. And on the right, you can see a stent that's been placed but has a, a new uh, intima layer um, growth around that has basically en encapsulated the stent. You can still see the stent surrounding here. Uh, so what our group uh, has pioneered, um, this was actually done by uh, one of the grad students who graduated last year. Um, she worked on intravascular and uh, OCT integrating it with intravascular IVIS. Uh, so again, the idea here is OCT can see this thin cap, um, but we can't see the depth of this lipid pool, whereas ultrasound uh, has poor resolution, but it can it's, penetrate deeper and see the, the depths of this uh, lipid pool. And by correlating the two together, even though the resolutions here are off, you can get a better idea of what is classified as a thin cap fibroathroma versus a, uh, a, a relatively stable um, plaque that doesn't need to be stented. Um, I mentioned earlier OCT, well, I've mentioned multiple times, OCT has no molecular contrast, 
But because uh, we're using light, we can integrate OCT with various other uh, uh, imaging modalities, such as fluorescence, which can provide us imaging contrast, uh, which then we can overlay on top of our OCT image. So in here, we're performing OCT imaging uh, combined with near-infrared fluorescence. So this circle around here represents fluorescence intensity, whereas the center here is the OCT scattering intensity. This is IVIS scattering intensity. So now we can actually look uh, where in the OCT images are the, uh, are where is there is thicker lipid um, uh, substructure underneath. Uh, and recently, a group from MGH has actually performed this in vivo, uh, where they're using actually near-infrared autofluorescence to visualize uh, ruptured plaques. Um, so essentially just performing OCT image to get the structural data and then uh, uh, imaging at 633 nanometers to perform uh, visualization of uh, uh, lipid uh, distributions. Uh, so as Vasan said earlier, what I performed mainly uh, focused on was airway imaging, uh, predominantly in the form of obstructive sleep apnea. So here you can see uh, a, a visual endoscope being inserted into the nose, and you can see uh, the complex shape of the airway. Uh, typically, when people think of the airway, they don't think of it as a very, they think of it as a straight tube uh, that's uniform across all dimensions. Um, I'll tell you right now that the airway is, the airway is incredibly complex and very, very uh, ununiform. Um, so just getting through the nose is complex, but here you can see he's about to turn, the, the, the physician is about to turn down into the airway, and you'll be able to see some of the, the structures of the upper airway outside of the nose. Um, but a sub CP apnea is actually uh, incredibly prevalent in, in, in the current population. And it's growing at increasing rates because uh, obstructive sleep apnea is linked with obesity. And obesity, as we all know, is increasing worldwide. Um, so what happens with obstructive sleep apnea is as a person falls asleep, so this is the airway and you can actually see, that's not uniform at all. Um, as a person falls asleep, due to gravity effects, uh, the muscles around the airway relax and the airway falls back on itself uh, and the patient per, or the patient actually essentially ends up choking on themselves. So they'll go through periods of like five to 10 seconds where they're not breathing and they're choking. Then the, the brain will send arousal signals. Uh, they'll wake up, they'll maybe turn a little bit, uh, move around. So they'll establish breathing again and then they'll go back to sleep. What happens over the course of the night is this continuously happens so that the brain never actually enters deep sleep. So they don't actually get restful sleep. So they'll sleep for eight hours, but then they'll wake up and they won't feel rested at all. They'll be drowsy uh, and um, have a, basically be, feel, feel terrible for most of the day. So obstructive sleep apnea is actually, um, I was actually surprised, but it's actually, the cost of obstructive sleep apnea is actually higher than uh, stroke, heart failure, asthma, and hypertension combined. Um, so it's actually, most people don't actually talk about it, I would say probably 50% of the people in this room have some form of sleep apnea, but we just deal with it. Um, but in terms of, of, of a medical need, it, it is an unclear, currently a clinical unmet need. So the reason why it's hard to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea is, again, as you saw in that video, the airway is extremely complex, and it's also dynamic. So in the case where I'm sitting and, a, and the physician is inserting the endoscope, my airway looks completely different from when I'm lying down or when I'm asleep. Um, and also, because of the complex nature of the airway, it's actually very difficult to identify where the obstruction is occurring. Uh, I was surprised to find out that most physicians typically will just go to the soft palate and shave it off and then hope that, hope that works. And then you'll come back in three months and they'll see if your sleep apnea is better. And if not, you'll go for, for more surgery. And if that's not better, then you might get more surgery or you just deal with it. Um, so most physicians don't have an accurate idea of where, where this obstruction is occurring. And in order to get that, you actually have to be able to visualize the airway as it's collapsing um, to get an idea of the obstruction. Uh, and once you have a model of the airway, then you can perform flow simulations and you can find out where the air is more turbulent and where it's more laminar and where this turbulence is occurring. And you can tell a physician, okay, at this point F, there's high velocity and high turbulence. You should probably increase the airway size there. Uh, so to do that, we perform fiber optic OCT imaging. In this case, we have a lens and a micromotor, uh, and then light comes out of the lens off this mirror, and this mirror rotates uh, 360 degrees. Uh, and we insert the probe in the airway, we rotate the probe, 
and we pull back as it's rotating, and this allows us to generate uh, a 3D uh, model of the airway. So here you can see a cross-sectional or a fly-through view of, of the OCT image. Uh, this is actually my airway. Um, volunteers weren't very easy to get, so I just stuck it in my own airway. <coughs> this is my own airway, and you can create uh, the reconstruction um, of the airway based off of that. So these are indicative cross-sectional slices of the airway. Uh, and to note, so in the cardiovascular imaging, the, air, the, the diameter that we're looking at are basically five millimeters at most. Here we're looking at an imaging scale that's over 10 millimeters. So this will tell you the, the, the scales that OCT can acquire images across. Naturally, you probably can't acquire images across the entire, so you can't probably acquire images at five millimeters and 10 mil, or five millimeters and 10, or yeah, five millimeters and greater than 10 millimeters at the same time with the same resolution due to the focusing optics. But uh, OCT as a technology can provide imaging across these various depth scales. So once we have the model, we can perform flow simulation. And I'm proud to say that my airway is very straight. I don't have much sleep apnea. Um, although I do snore a little, I'm told. Um, but in this case, uh, compared to some of the obstruction cases I've seen, uh, it's actually uh, fairly open. And we also perform intraoperative OCT. So this is a case where um, uh, we're performing imaging in the subglottic, which is right below. If you take your vocal cords and you go down about a centimeter, that's where your subglottis is. Um, and this is actually the narrowest point in the, in the airway, because this is the only point in the airway where the cartilage is completely surrounding the airway. So what happens is, <clears throat> Typically, if a person is undergoing surgery and they're going to be intubated, um, the, the tube is placed all the way down into the subglottic. And if they're intubated for too long, uh, the pressures of the tube against the airway wall can cause uh, fibrosis to, uh, damage and fibrosis to occur, which can lead to scarring and a reduction in airway size. So here, we in the, in the top row, we perform imaging basically before uh, the, the surgeon <clears throat> went to go fix subglottic stenosis. And then the bottom, you can see the, the rapid increase and in, with a large increase in airway uh, cross-sectional area as a, as a uh, afterwards. And to get a better idea, you can see the rotation modeling. So here, subglottic stenosis, and then here, and then post-surgery, a much more uniform airway size. Uh, and then the last thing I'll talk about today um, to give you an idea. So OCT typically, as I said, has a resolution on the order of five to eight micrometers. Um, however, that doesn't mean you can't get information from features that are smaller than this resolution. You may not be able to directly visualize them, uh, but because we're talking about scattering, um, features smaller than your actual resolution can still be detected based on the phase of relationship. Remember when I talked about the Doppler phase, um, we can detect phase shifts um, up to basically the wavelength of your light source being used. And the phase sensitivity in an interferometer is much, much, much more fine than the actual uh, uh, depth changing sensitivity. So um, in this case, what we're trying to look at is airway cilia. So cilia, if you don't know, are these micro, micro, uh, microscopic structures lining the uh, epithelial walls in your airway and, and various other structures. And what they perform is, or what they do is they, they, prop, they, they beat at a certain frequency and they propagate mucus um, uh, along the, 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 the lining of the walls. So essentially, when something gets trapped in your airway, or in your lungs, or uh, as a particulate, it gets trapped in the mucus. The cilia uh, beat as a function of over time, and they propagate the mucus, and then you either swallow it or you spit it out. So they're actually the first line of defense for, uh, for your immune system. Uh, typically, cilia are five to seven micrometers in length. However, um, uh, this, over the course of their beating cycle, they, they vary by uh, on the range of one to two micrometers. So a, a complete cilia is just, on the, um, is just on the edge of what you might be able to detect with OCT. Um, however, typically you won't be able to see much. And, and the, the motion induced by the cilia is definitely sub-OCT resolution. So cilia are um, defined. Uh, they undergo two strokes. One is defined as the power stroke in which they, they move very, very fast and rapidly. Uh, and that's when they're propagating mucus forward. 
and then the other is a recovery stroke in which they dip down below the mucus layer and then they move um, back to the start of the power stroke. They're also defined by this uh, metachronal coordination in which, in which adjacent cilia will beat kind of at an offset pattern, um, uh, kind of to, to basically for a coordinated propagation of mucus. If they all beat it at the same time, the mucus um, would actually move slower than having them just have a beat slightly at an, uh, at an offset phase. So the current methodology to measure cilia of motion is you use a cytology brush, you stick it to where you're trying to get harvest cilia, you plate them on cells, you grow them, you look at them under a microscope, uh, and you have to essentially look at them under a phase conscious microscope and position them orthogonal to your, so you're, you're, you're looking at them down this way. And then you have, in most cases, you have an undergrad sit here, look at this video, slow it down, and you count how many cycles they're beating over time. Uh, and then you can say the beat frequency is this with the standard deviation of, of such and such. Obviously, there's no real way to, to automate this system, and this is how it's been done for, for 40 years now. Uh, essentially, it's just now, instead of using um, uh, uh, photomultiplier tubes, we use digital high-speed cameras, but the counting technique is still the same. So the way we did it is we decided to use Doppler OCT to, to visualize the upwards and downwards motion of the cilia particles. And here you can see uh, this. So this, this, this change in intensity here, uh, which looks like speckle change, is actually caused by uh, cilia motion. So you can't actually visualize the cilia changing. Uh, but you can actually see, as they're moving upwards and downwards, changing by a factor of, of one wavelength, they're causing constructive and deconstructive interference, which is creating this speckle pattern. So if we look, so what we do is we, we scan across the tissue layer continuously over time. So this is uh, the scanning area, and then this is what we're looking over time. And then we're looking at um, just the cilia layer. So it's an on phos projection, we're scanning across space, and then continuously over time. So if you look at the intensity of the cilia over time as a function of space, you might be able to say you see some periodic motion effects, but it's not really evident. However, if you look at the Doppler effects, in this case, yellow corresponds to regions of upwards motion, blue corresponds to regions of downwards motion. You can clearly see that uh, the, the, the power stroke and recovery stroke are visible in the cilia layers. And then if you take just uh, the cross-sectional, if you just take this intensity as a, on, on this line, you plot it as a function, uh, you take the Fourier transform to plot the frequency, you can see there is a slight peak at five, but I wouldn't really, I'd be hesitant to say that's a peak. Whereas if you look at the, the Fourier transform of the Doppler signal, you can see a clear peak at five hertz. So naturally, cilia also change beat frequency as a function of temperature. So what we performed then is we performed, cilia, uh, we vary the temperature first at 25 hertz, and you compare it versus 27 hertz, it doesn't look like there's much happening. And then at 29 hertz, you can see it's, it's much more periodic, the frequency is increasing. 31 hertz, frequency is drastically increasing. And at 34 hertz, drastically increasing. And this is because at lower temperatures, cilia actually don't beat very fast, but as the temperature increases, uh, the increased beating of the cilia actually causes surrounding cilia to become coordinated and have a, uh, uh, and to beat more uh, in phase. Uh, and then again, you can plot out the frequency as a function of space um, uh, uh, and temperature. And then the last possible use for OCT is my, my advisor likes to throw this in at a time is you can use it as a fingerprint sensor, um, which I think is kind of overkill. But basically, you can perform OCT imaging. You can see the ridges in the fingerprint. And the nice thing is you can actually see the sweat glands in your fingers. Uh, and this allows you to perform uh, a higher level of fingerprint sensing than compared to what your iPhone could typically visualize. And that is just a subset. Any questions? Yeah, I, was, I was wondering if you could say more about the, the whole eye imaging and what kind of techniques are being used to, to get that. Um, it, I assume it's an instantaneous depth of focus that's ten, tens of um, millimeters long. Uh, so what enabled this technology, um, <clears throat> so essentially what they're doing is uh, they're using a collimated beam, so they're not really focusing. Uh, 
because they're looking at a wide field of view, they don't actually really care about lateral resolution in this case. This is more just of a demonstration of what they can do. Um, so the resolution isn't actually that great, but what enabled them to do whole field imaging is actually Vixel lasers, um, which have incredibly long imaging ranges. Uh, so this essentially allows you in one imaging scan to, to image across uh, all the layers. Uh, but, you're, but you're giving up lateral resolution. Yeah, you do give up lateral resolution. Focusing the beam down yeah. to tens of microns. Yeah, if, if, you, if you wanted a high resolution image, you would, still, you would still tune your system to focus where you want it. This is more just of a, this is what we can, a, a technology of what we can do. And then if you increase your field, if you increase your, your scanning field of view so large, then your lateral resolution doesn't really have to be small. You're looking at large features anyways. So it, it's not really evident. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't understand about the swept source of CT. So uh, is it coherent or? It's still, co okay. It's still coherent. Um, it's a little bit different. So in this case, you have a broadband source that's low coherence, right? In this case, you have a tunable laser. And uh, you, have, you, you can think of it at any point in time. It's, an, it's, it's a narrow, narrow line width laser. Right? So in this case, if it was a broadband source, you wouldn't be able to perform interference across the large depth, right? You would only get interference at a certain, at a certain region in the coherence length of the laser, right? But because this is a tunable laser, so at any instantaneous point in time, it's basically a monochromatic source. It has long coherence length, right? So you're, you can actually inter interrogate across the entire depth of the sample, and then once you have the spectral, spectral information as a function of k, then when you, it's basically a linear equation. Once you acquire them all together, that's when you arrive back at the low coherence regime. Can I ask about the, the uh, differential detection uh, scheme? Uh, in the right uh, figure, uh -huh. you use a, a differential detection. The, uh, but I, I have no idea uh, how it works. How, how this works? Yeah, do, do you need differential? Uh, Diffraction? No, no, you don't. Okay, so the laser itself, you can think of it, it it's, it's, it's tuning wavelength as a function of time, right? So over the course of time, the wavelength is looking like this, right? Uh, it's not pen. Right, so you have lambda and time, right? So over the course of time, your, your wavelength is actually increasing, right? So when you, when you sample your interference fringe as a function of time, you're already directly sampling this as a function of wavelength because the wavelength is encoded in time. So you, you can directly sample the time signal. Yeah, uh, why do you use differential detection uh, in this case? Differential detection? Yeah. You mean this? Yeah. To, to remove the DC signal. To, to, so the interference fringe uh, will have a DC signal on top of it, okay. and so the, the, uh, uh, balance detection allows us to remove. So is it because uh, uh, it is uh, more noise effective? Yeah, uh, it's, it's more noise effective. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's actually one of the advantages swept source has over spectral domain. Because you could, if, in order to build a balanced spectral domain de detector, you need two high-speed cameras, and that would be like $100,000, and no one would do that. 